Would you turn with me in your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6? And we're continuing in our verse by verse study through the Sermon on the Mount, picking up in verse 16, where the topic is uh, dealing with fasting, but I've entitled it Be Humble something that's relatively easy to do. Would you mind standing with me as we begin by uh, reading this passage together? Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 16. It reads as follows. Of course, Jesus is the speaker, and he says, When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show men they are fasting. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full, but... When you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to men that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Let's begin with prayer. Father, I ask as we look to your word this morning that you would help us to understand the text, but also you'd help us to understand the subtext as well. There are truths, Lord, that are relevant to all of us, and then there's some things that you want to speak to us personally and individually. I'm not capable of doing that, Father, but your Holy Spirit is. Your Holy Spirit has an ability to take your truths to a deeper level than most of us even realize. We invite you to do that today, that you touch every one of our hearts individually and severally, Lord, that we might know how much you love us and how wonderful your grace is and how perfect your purposes are for our life. Give us that grace and understanding, Lord, we pray today in Jesus' holy name. Amen. You may be seated. Reading the Gospels, it becomes apparent that one of the things that Jesus disliked, we might even say hated, was hypocrisy. Some 12 times he speaks out against it in the Gospels, and he even dedicated the entirety of the 23rd chapter of Matthew to describing the corrupting and corrosive effect it has upon people when it's lived out as a manner of life. He referred to it in Matthew 16 as the leaven of the Pharisee. In other words, leaven or yeast that kind of spreads through a loaf of bread and puffs it up into something bigger and larger than what it actually is. It became a metaphor to speak about something being leavened as being a corrupting or inflating influence in somebody's lives. And he called it that because he said what it does is it changes people's focus from a devotion to God to a devotion to men and self. In other words, instead of being inwardly focused in terms of our relationship with God, we become outwardly focused on how we can impress or move or manipulate other people around us. Clearly, what we recognize is that hypocrisy is, we might call it one of the besetting sins of religion. Not just Christianity and not just religion in general, but every form of religion. In fact, every form of human behavior is often infected with a hypocritical way of going about it. The idea of presenting ourselves to be different than when we actually know we are. Different from who we are when nobody else is watching. So it's not surprising that three times in this sermon, Jesus makes this statement in essence, do not be like the hypocrites. We saw it first of all when he was talking about giving. He says, when you give, do not announce it or literally sound a trumpet as the hypocrites do so that you can be honored by men. Then in verse five, we talked about prayer and he says, when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites standing on the street corners Uh, so that basically he says, so they can be seen by men, they can display their spirituality in a public setting. And now here again in verse 16, he speaks about fasting. When you fast, do not look somber. In other words, literally to have a sad and gloomy face. But he says, and they, because they disfigure their faces, literally the Greek word means they ruin their faces, it implies the idea that they put on this pain-deprived, suffering look on their face so that they, they can show men that they are fasting. You see, Jesus' concern was not what, with what they were doing, but why they were doing it. 
You see, if the why behind an action is wrong, it corrupts everything about the action. It's not so much what we're doing that becomes the problem, it's the reason that motivates us to do it. So that with my hands I can build something of beauty or I can use it as a destructive weapon. My feet I can use to follow after the paths of righteousness or I can walk in the paths of darkness and destruction. My words can be used to bless they can also be used to curse. So it's not the words that's a problem. It's not hands or feet, but rather the heart that lies behind them that is always the issue. It's so easy for us in a religious or spiritual or Christian context to become so focused upon what people are doing outwardly that we lose sight of the fact that what God concerns himself with is not so much the outward expression as it is the inward motivation. Why am I doing what I do? You see, clearly Jesus expected them to do all three of these things, which is why he prefaces each of his comments on these three behaviors by saying, when you give, when you pray and when you fast. After all, as he would later tell the Pharisees when he chides them for their hypocrisy, he says, these are the things that you should do. So there's, a, there's no great accomplishment in praying or fasting or giving. These are supposed to be part of what we do. The problem is that they were doing all these things, but they were doing it not for God, but for their own selves. They did it as a way of advertising and promoting their own self-interest in the eyes of other people. In fact, I like the way that Peterson puts it when he renders it in his paraphrase edition. He says, you turn giving and praying and fasting into a theatrical production, making a regular show out of your prayers and hoping for stardom. You follow formulas and programs and pedal techniques for getting what you want from God. And then he adds, it might turn out, turn you to a small time celebrity, but it won't make you a saint. Don't fall for that nonsense. You see, God has essentially called us to the polar opposite of hypocrisy, and that is a life of humility. And humility is an easy word to say, it's really difficult for you and I to live it out. It's not something that's native to our nature. I hate to admit it, I'm sure that you do as well, that hypocrisy is not something that we have to work out, work into falling into. It, it's something that's kind of natural, that oftentimes we want to put our best foot forward. We want to make a good first impression, but somewhere in that process, it's easy to begin to substitute who you really are for someone that people assume that you are. And so the call to humility is so challenging because essentially it means a honesty and transparency in our human relationships that often make us fearful. We're often afraid that if people see us as we really are, that somehow they will not like us. Because essentially the things that we know are hidden from view are the things that are hidden for a purpose. We don't like those things about ourselves. We don't want anybody else to know about them either. And so it's easy to kind of slip into a phoniness, if you will, kind of a fraudulent way of living out your life. As Christians, we can pretend that we're more religious, we're more spiritual. And we can even adopt things like fasting as a way of kind of counterbalancing the reality that inside our hearts are hungering and thirsting for things that God says, thou shalt not. That creates that inner shame conflict that most people live with. The word humility, in fact, oftentimes is viewed as synonymous with being weak. In fact, some dictionaries almost define it that way. One I read said, humility is a low self-regard, a sense of worthlessness and unworthiness. Well, that may certainly be some people's view. This was a common view in the ancient world. It may seem strange to us, but they saw humility as being a character flaw. 
The Greeks and the Romans and the Egyptians and others said, no, if you really want to be successful, you have to believe in yourself and really promote yourself and have the ultimate extreme of confidence. You have to become the adult version of the little choo-choo who said, I think I can, I think I can, in the hopes that when you get to the crest of whatever you're trying to climb, then you can slide down and say, I knew I could, I knew I could. And we hear it in our culture saying, people, you need to believe in yourself and you need to have confidence. In fact, even in the athletic world, we see that suddenly the humility that used to mark the athletes of my childhood would always say, well, I'm just one man on a team and I got a lucky swing and I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. Instead is replaced with this braggadocio posturing where people are running around and saying, I'm number one and I'm the greatest. And suddenly the idea of boasting of yourself and trash talking is viewed as being a virtue. Well, you have to understand that that's closer to the way the ancient world that Jesus was speaking about viewed themselves than just that than we think or see within the biblical context. What I'm essentially saying is that when Jesus said these things, they ran counter to the culture that he was a part of. The religious people took great pride in being super spiritual. They dressed the part. They ex put on expensive, loud speaking robes that declared to everybody, this is who I am. So when Jesus says, don't blow a trumpet every time you make an offering, when he said that don't go around looking ashen and gray and sad and unkempt when you're fasting to show how much you're suffering for God, there were people culturally who simply said, and I would say the majority, who would step back and go, wait a minute, that's not how it's done. It's important for us to understand that when Jesus said these things, he was going against the current, not with the current. And there were people who were so invested in these things that they became resistant to the very fact. Because the simple belief was that if you drop your, your bragging, if you drop your boasting, and you don't keep on insert, asserting yourself, not only will you not get ahead, but you will actually become defeated and dominated by your enemies and your opponents. Yet when we read the Bible, we find that he's speaking about a t totally different way of life. In fact, as we've talked in this series earlier, that you begin to see yourself in a, through a different lens. In fact, the humility that the Bible speaks of is described as one of the greatest of virtues and also the source of our greatest strengths. Humility comes when we see ourselves correctly. That is, when I see myself in relationship to God, I have an accurate appraisal of him, I have a truthful appraisal of myself, and I have a realistic view of my place in the world. That I begin to realize that he is God, and I am not. There's no little God inside of me that somehow answers to the God in heaven. It's not about finding the, the God within. It's about finding the God who is without and inviting him to have a throne in my life and to rule and dictate over my affairs. Not me figuring out how I can govern my life the way I want it to run. That he is the creator. That makes me the creature. <laughs> he is the master. That makes me the servant. I exist for his pleasure, not the other way around. Now, to some of you, this may seem like obvious things to say, but I say them because I increasingly hear within our culture things like, it's all about what makes you happy that matters. And I just want to be very clear, that's not how the Bible describes the will of God or the way the universe is intended by him to work. And it is not the way that you find your best life. Amen. In fact, it was Isaiah who said, we are the clay, you are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. And then he says, shall what is formed say to him who formed it, he did not make me? And yet that's the entire premise of the scientific world today, or I call the religion of scientism, that we somehow made ourselves. 
I listen to very learned and informed people in the scientific and philosophical world who make statements that sometimes I think are so silly on their face, I can't understand that they're not embarrassed by it. But when they say things like, when the egg decided to come out as a chicken instead of a lizard, <laughs> or when we decided that we would develop the ability to speak, and if you break that down and realize the difference between a primate and a human and their ability to speak and communicate, that there are so many thousands, if not millions, of different structural differences that allow one to speak and keep the other one from just grunting noises, and yet somehow we made ourselves. Somehow we just decided, I'm going to be a talker. Some of you are carried away. But because we didn't make ourselves and we recognize that we are part of his creation, we are creatures created by him, this is why we're repeatedly exhorted by like James who says, humble yourself before the Lord. Or in Peter he says, clothe yourselves, literally put on humility. So that humility is something that I can choose to pursue in my life but it's based upon seeing myself correctly in relationship to the God of the universe. That's why Paul could simply say to the, in Acts 20, at the end of his earthly life, he says, I serve the Lord with great humility, or literally translated, with lowliness of mind. A not lowliness of mind in terms or relationship to other people. Paul didn't think he was less than any other person, but he recognized that he was on one hand equal with all because essentially we all are under God. That's the right perspective. That the humility of the Bible isn't this poor mouthing going around saying what a terrible person I am, but recognizing that I am not God and he is and I am subject to him in every way so that Paul would say to the Athenian philosophers in Acts chapter 17, in him we live, in him we move, in him we have our very being. My very existence at this moment is an expression of the love and the grace and the kindness of God. That anything that we accomplish is allowed because God has chosen not only to open that door, but to bless us as we pass through it. Because, maybe most importantly, that, and this surprises many people, that humility is actually one of the most significant characteristics that God gave in identifying Christ the Messiah. When Zechariah the prophet spoke of the coming Messiah, he said in the, the ninth chapter, in the ninth verse, behold, your king comes to you humble. Christ came in humility. He humbled himself, we're told, and he took upon himself the appearance of a man. And that's why Paul said, my power is made perfect in Christ through my weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest upon me. Because ultimately, God gives exaltation to those who enter his presence with humility. That if I want to be lifted up in my life, then I have to humble myself before God and become a worshiper. Because Christ, who being found in appearance as a man, humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death on the cross. Christ, in his love for you and me, humbled himself before you and on your account, dying in your place on the cross. Which really brings me to the whole conversation of fasting, if you will, because that's what fasting is all about. It is a voluntary humbling of ourselves before God through a temporary act of denying ourselves of something that would be part of our normal appetite and that we do it to help us better concentrate and to focus upon God. You see, what fasting does, it reminds us of how weak we actually are. In Matthew 4, 4, Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Ironically, nothing reveals that to us more fully 
that when we deny ourselves of our necessary foods and our necessary drink, that we become weakened in that particular condition, which really becomes a greater opening for realizing our dependence upon God. Now, a fast can include all sorts of things. It include food. We often think of, first of all, it can include also drink. But it can apply to anything that takes up my time and limits my ability to focus my attention on God. Now, some of us would do well to fast on the amount of time we spend on the computer or we spend watching TV. There is a worthy fast. It's amazing how sometimes we could fast from our smartphones Because I have found that there are times when I just put it away to the irritation of a lot of people, including my own family, but it creates a time and space of quietness with God. Sometimes I wonder, how did we survive without them? Yesterday, I was driving to the hardware store working on my sprinkler system, and I got up to the corner to turn towards town, and I suddenly realized I had left my phone on my desk. And I thought, I used to do this all the time without a phone. Why do I need a phone? Nah, I can live without it. And I immediately did a U-turn and went back and got it. (laughs) And I do it for a good reason, because 90% of the time when I get to the store, I forget what I was there for, and I have to call my wife and say, now, why did I come here? (laughs) But there's some things that we need to fast from, some things we should never fast on. And it's interesting, the things we should fast from, we have a hard time fasting from, and the things that we need to fast from, or should never fast from, we're good at, like reading our Bibles or prayer. (laughs) Sometimes we're very good at fasting from Scripture or fasting from prayer or fasting from church. You see, the idea is we just eliminate something, we don't give time to it, is essentially what a fast is all about. And I find in our day and age, we have it all backwards. We wouldn't think of missing our favorite game or our favorite show, but at the same time, we'll think nothing of letting go of the very word of life that gives, comes to us in the Scriptures. It's easy to get our lives out of balance. But at its root, the idea is that when we fast, we remove or neglect some normal thing that is a distraction from other things so that we can simply give greater attention to seeking God. It's not something that's mystical or, in fact, it's one of the most very practical thing. It simply means that I give something up for a season of time, even something that may be essentially necessary. But one thing I want to make very clear is it's not something that we do to display how spiritual or mystical we are, or as Jesus said, to show or to do things that are obvious to men. Rather, it's the simple removal of an attraction or a distraction from my daily life so that I can focus my attention exclusively on hearing God more clearly in my life. It's like one of the things I notice about myself as I get older, that my hearing acumen is becoming less. In other words, I find if the TV is on and my wife is talking, I can't hear a word she's saying. I mean, quite literally, if my wife's in another room, I have to turn the TV off and say, what did you say? Because if I have any conflicting noise coming in, I can no longer pick up the signals. In fact, one of the things, and you're going to think I'm making this up, ladies, I am not. This is actually a fact. That as we age, as men age, the range in which we begin to lose our hearing is exactly the range where most women's voices are found. I'm not making that up. So when he said, I didn't hear you say that, he didn't hear you say that. Now, if he has fingers in both ears, then don't believe him. But the simple fact is, we become dull of hearing. And sometimes we just need to close off the noise. We need to quiet the world around us. When the psalmist wrote, be still and know that I am God. Sometimes we just need to fast from the conflicting noise and things that are out there so that we can just listen carefully to God. 
Many times what we need to do is fast from things that we focus on so that we can just listen to God. And that's the idea, particularly in the ancient world, where the preparation of meals was almost an ongoing and, and constant activity that sometimes to fast actually meant women didn't have to work and they could simply seek God without having the distraction of providing a necessary meal for their family. Unfortunately, to many, today there are many people who fast for a whole lot of other reasons and not all of them are biblical reasons, in fact. I think it's interesting when Paul writes to, the, to Timothy, he says to him, uh, <laughs> bodily exercise, uh, he says, exercise yourself towards godliness for bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things having the promise of life that now is and that which is to come. You see, bodily exercise is a good thing. If I can just, I'm, I'm waiting for the exercise pill that will make me do the good thing on a regular basis. But the end of the day is it only profits us for a short term. And so fasting has become kind of a hip way of being healthy, although it may be a terribly misinformed way. I mean, I, I was reading on the internet about weight loss fasts, which I thought was really interesting because when you fast, the problem is that your body thinks it's going into a famine and so it slows your metabolism down so that the next time you eat, it can absorb more of the fat and store more residue in your body so that you're ready for periods in which you'll go hungry. I find that weight loss fasts are really just a fast way to gain weight. But there's also people talking about toxic fasts, which is like the idea you'll fast and only drink water or certain liquids and it'll purge the toxins out of your body, when in fact your kidneys and your liver are designed for that and have been doing it quite well. And you'll find that whatever you put in your body will have to go through your kidneys and your liver so the livers can do what livers and kidneys do. In other words, I think it's stupid. Still others practice so-called spiritual fasts that promise to put you in an altered state of consciousness, which happens to be what the body does when it begins to starve. It goes into a conscious. I mean, if any of you have ever fasted, you know that how loopy and kind of you can get as your body begins to go into a panic mode and you're deprived of necessary nutrients and fats in particular. There are even political fasts, people who will fast for various social crusades to rally support or protest against some government or political system that they see as their uh, oppressive adversary. But none of these have anything to do with fasting as the Bible describes it. In fact, one of the clearest expressions of a Bible fast was that done by Daniel, where he tells us in the 10th chapter of his prophecy, he said he fasted for three weeks. And then he says, I ate no choice food, which means he ate food, he just didn't eat the good stuff. So I just want to recommend you, as you're going through that table with all the goodies on them, I'm particularly the, the berry pies and the chocolate cake, I think you should fast from that today and just pass that by. Because that's what Daniel did. It's a great place to start. But it wasn't a foodless. He says, I ate no meat, I drank no wine, none of it touched my lips, I used no lotions at all until the three weeks were over. It wasn't a total fast, it was a partial fast. But at the end of three weeks, the Lord spoke to him. He says, since the first day that you set your mind to humble yourself before God, your words were heard. He humbled himself before God by denying himself anything except the most basic ingredients. But here's the idea we get many times because we think if people are going to go on a fast, the longer the fast, the closer you get to God. Well, in one sense it is because you're getting closer to death. <laughs> and that's why I think most people are surprised when they discover that the Bible doesn't say a whole lot about fasting. In fact, there's only one time that Israel was ever commanded to fast, and that was on the Day of Atonement, and that was for one day. So when you look at the Old Testament law, it, the only time it even says anything about somebody fasting was when 
God said, on the Day of Atonement, once a year, you'll fast for a day. Now, other people did fast. But you know what? The Bible never tells us how long we are supposed to fast. I know some people will point out, well, Moses fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and Jesus fasted 40 days and 40 nights. But it's clearly a divine empowerment. This was not ordinary, and it's not something that we're instructed to do or to imitate. I mean... <laughs> The fact of the matter is, people who go on those long extended fasts almost always suffer permanent damage to their internal organs or other parts of their body. And that's why I agree with Warren Wiersbe who said, simply to deprive ourselves of a natural benefit, such things as food and sleep, which God says he gives to us by his grace and his goodness, is not itself fasting. He goes on, nothing that is truly spiritual will violate that which God has given us in nature. God usually does not tear down one good thing, that is tear down your health, in order to build up another, that which is that he would build up your spiritual life. I think it's important to even say when we talk about fasting that there are some people who should never, ever fast. If you are a diabetic if you're a nursing mom, if you're pregnant or breastfeeding, you should not diet or go into any kind of fast where you're depriving yourself of basic nutrients. In fact, there is some fasting that God even says he hates. And basically, in places like Isaiah 58, he talk about those who fast before the Lord, but not from the things that concern him most. You see, I want to kind of change your way of thinking about a fast, that we often focus upon the deprivation of the body of food and its nutrients and how painful or uncomfortable that makes us feel. Now, ask yourself a question. Why is it when you touch something hot, you pull your hand back? You have a natural reaction to pain that's designed to protect you. The same is true when you lose your ability to taste food. The idea of food becomes really a chore, not something you enjoy. So what did God do to keep us eating? He made food taste good. He made that triple berry pie out there taste as good as I'm sure it looks. Why? Because we are supposed to Delight our souls, the psalmist said, in fatness. I know some of us are much more dedicated to that scripture than others. Granted, but... My heart is with you. My wife's isn't. But anyway... But Isaiah complains, he says, they act so pious, they come to the temple every day and seem delighted to hear my laws. They make a show of coming to me and asking me to take action on their behalf. We have fasted before you, they say. Why aren't you impressed? We have done much penance and you don't even notice it. Have you ever found yourself in that space? God, I've, I've gone to church, I've read my Bible, I've prayed, I've fasted, I've served, I've sacrificed, I've done all those things. Why is my life so screwed up right now? Well, he says, I'll tell you why. <laughs> it's because you're living for yourself, even while you're fasting. You dress in sackcloth and cover yourself selves with ashes. Is that what I call, you call fasting? Do you really think this will please the Lord? No, he says, the kind of fasting I want calls you to free those who are wrongly imprisoned and to stop oppressing those who work for you. Treat them fairly. Give them what they earn. I want you to share your food with the hungry and to welcome poor wanderers into your home, to give clothes to those who need them and do not hide from relatives who need your help. That's why 150 years later, Zechariah responding to the same kind of question. The people come and say, are we to continue fasting on the fifth and the seventh month in mourning for the captivity in Babylon and the destruction of the temple? And he answers them, did you really fast for me? Should you not have obeyed the word which the Lord proclaimed through the prophets? You see, sometimes people make such a big deal about their fasting and how long they fasted, and they're glad to tell you, and you don't need to know it because their breath already admits how many days they've been fasting. 
And yet God says, don't you understand what I really do is that you really walk in love towards the people around you and care about them. You see, what religious hypocrisy does is it robs us of spiritual reality. Again, where as we said, we substitute reputation for character, mere words for true prayer, money for the devotion of the heart. And I would simply add, we also substitute fasting many times for true faith because we think that by fasting, I can manipulate and coerce God to giving me what I want, which is nothing else but will worship. It's not, it's not the worship of God, it's worshiping my own willpower. That's why by the time Jesus, time of Jesus, this brand of what I call faux fasting had become so extreme that apart from Jesus' 40-day fast in the wilderness, we have no evidence of him or his disciples ever fasting again. In fact, we have texts that indicate that Jesus and his ministry on the earth did not fast after that 40 days. Matthew 9 tells us, it says, Then John's disciples came and asked him, How is it that we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Jesus answered, how can the guests of the bridegroom mourn while he is with them? The time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and then they will fast. And in a few other instances, five other times in the, in the New Testament, we're told that they fasted without ever giving us a command to do the same. Because again, in Matthew 11, we find that John, they said, came eating and drinking, and they say, he has a demon. And then Jesus said, the son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, look, a glutton and a wine bibber. So the very fact that Jesus didn't fast became a point of accusation against them. But Jesus said, I am with them now. There's nothing to fast about. They should celebrate. The day will come when I will be taken from them, and then they will fast. This is not to suggest that there is anything wrong with fasting. Since it's clear that after Jesus' resurrection, his disciples on occasions, and I say again, there's only five mentions in the rest of the New Testament of people engaging in fasting. It doesn't tell us how long they fasted. It doesn't tell us what they fasted from. But we know that they fasted. But it was hardly an injunction. It's, it's a, there's, there's no commandment. We're never told in Scripture how often we fast, or nor are we commanded in the New Testament to fast. Anyone who's criticized, or no one should ever be criticized for fasting or not fasting, because it's not presented in any way, shape, or form as a measure of somebody's spirituality. To fast or not to fast is really a personal choice. I have fasted many times over the years simply because it seemed the appropriate thing to do within that moment and within that context. But I'll tell you again why I did it. I didn't want to prove to God how long I could go without food because how long I go without food is not very impressive. Okay, I want to confess, I fast every day. That's why every morning I have a break fast. That is so clever. <laughs> but you see, it's, it's very simple and very practical when you come right down to it. It's not so much that by denying myself the food and feeling the, the hunger pain that somehow that makes God take more notice of me. I don't do it to impress God. I do it to alleviate my own mind from having to focus on those things and to simply draw near to God. If you fast long enough, if you fast especially over several days, you'll find that your hunger for food will go away. And it will not come back until you're on the verge of starvation and death. That's why it's so meaningful or so significant when we find that Jesus fasted 40 days and 40 nights. And then it says, and then he hungered because death was beginning to take place in his life. And again, I 
am not impressed and certainly would not encourage anybody to try to prove how spiritual or to solve their own moral or spiritual problems by fasting them away. Our deliverance from sin comes by confession and his forgiveness and his cleansing. I've talked to so many people through the years saying, I've got this habit and I can't give it up. I've fasted for days to try to get God to release me and he just doesn't do it. And the end of the day, they don't want to take responsibility that it's their choice that's creating the problem. If you really want to fast from something, fast from the thing that you're doing that you know is wrong and do right and pray that God would give you the strength to consistently do it. But if you're going to fast, let me give you some right reasons and right ways to fast. That first of all, be like Daniel and see it as an opportunity to humble yourself before God so that you can hear God's word more clearly. I remember one fast I went on and early in my Christian walk and, and I, I fasted because I wanted to know God's will on a situation. I was really at a critical juncture in my life. And so I said, well, I'm going to go out in the desert. And I did. I went out in the desert and I fasted and prayed. I was there for about three days. And I remember praying and praying and praying and reading my Bible and waiting upon the Lord. And I have to admit to you, nothing special happened. I mean, I thought if God's ever going to really be loud and clear in my life, it's going to come then. He didn't. And I remember as I was driving home, a little bit disappointed and thinking, God, I just wanted you to speak to me. I wanted to know yes or no, left or right, north or south. I wanted this clear word from God. And as I was driving home, disappointed for the lack of clarity, I suddenly heard God speak to me. You'll be okay. I didn't want to hear that. <laughs> I didn't want to, I want to know how I'm going to be okay. And God just simply very clearly said to me, just trust me, I've got this. I've got this. But we never fast in order to prove how much power, willpower we have, or how much endurance we have, or to somehow enhance the level of our spirituality or deepen it. Most of the fasts I've engaged in over the years have been unwitting. I suddenly realized that I haven't eaten for a significant amount of time, and that never really occurred to me. I never set out to do that. I just set out to seek God, and my appetite went away. But I found myself having encounters with God that were not prophetic or visionary, but they were very powerful and meaningful in my life because I put everything aside, and I just focused on the Lord and on his word, and suddenly there came a simplicity and a clarity in who I was and what my purpose in life was all about. The secondly, it should be done within the parameters that God gives you. What you fast from, how long you fast, and what the purpose of that, let that be something that God defines in your life. Because I quite often say to people, is God calling you to fast? Or are you just adopting this in order because you think it's part of the spiritual discipline package? Now, if you feel like I'm hitting this pretty hard, it's because I am so weary of hearing people talk about fasting as if it's part of the spiritual requirements. We're supposed to read the word, we're supposed to pray, we share our faith, we go to church, and don't forget to fast. And the only problem is I can't find any place in the scripture that says that. That's not the fifth leg on the table. So if you're going to fast, ask God how long and what from? What is your will regarding all of this? And thirdly, it must, it must, it must, it must be done privately. It's between you and God. If you feel that you need to tell other people that you're fasting, you probably shouldn't. If you need to come bedraggled into the office unshaved, unwashed, unkempt, and you just, with this miserable look on your face, and they're saying, what's wrong? And they're saying, I'm fasting. Now, first of all, my thought is they're going to say, I'm not interested in following your God. <laughs> but secondly, Jesus just very clearly said, just the opposite should be the case. Nobody should know that you're fasting. 
Because the very real danger is that we get into a performance art. We start doing things to perform for other people. God who is in secret wants to reveal himself in secret to those who seek him in secret. The psalmist said that he went into the secret place of the most high God. And there it is, he had this profound encounter with God. That's, that's what we fast. And anything that hinders that from happening in your life is something that you should fast from. But we need to keep in context, I believe, that fasting is only one specialized tool. I think about Abraham Maslow's comment once. He said he called it uh, the law of instruments. It, I'll be with him in a minute. I just got to finish up a few more minutes. I'm, okay. <laughs> I'll tell you what. When we first started carrying cell phones, I took my wife to the opera. <laughs> and in one of those moments where suddenly it was completely silent, her phone rang. <laughs> I got up and sat someplace else and these people, <laughs> I just remember the panic we went through trying to get our hands on that phone. Anyway, so please, whoever that was, I'm not judging you. God, on the other hand. <laughs> but anyway, back on point. <laughs> Abraham Maslow made this comment. He said, it is tempting when the only tool you have is a hammer to treat everything as if it were a nail. It's a tool, but it isn't the only tool in our toolbox. If you're fasting, you should never tell anybody you're fasting. Nor should you tell somebody else that they should fast. That's one of those secret things between you and God. How much you give, you're supposed to give, and how much you give, well, that's between you and God. It's none of my business or anybody else's. That when you pray and how long you pray and what you pray for, that's, that's between you and God. It should never be used to impress other people by how much I pray. I think many prayer meetings get ruined by people who show up to pray because they want to show off when they pray. And that destroys a good prayer meeting because suddenly they're not talking to God, they're talking to the other people in the room. Let me be honest, one of the challenges I face weekly is getting up here and opening with prayer. Because there's this thing inside of every one of us that wants to put on a good face. I want to pray a good prayer. So people say, oh, this is going to be a good message because he's, he's in tune with God today. <laughs> and it's easy to pray to you instead of praying to God. Prayer needs to first become secret before we ever try to do it in public. And fasting should always be done in secret and should never be promoted in public. Yes, ancient Israel sometimes called people, called the people together to fast and pray because they had sinned greatly before God. But at the end of the day, we're never getting a list of, given a list of the names of those who are there or how long they fasted, or what they fasted from. Because God looks at the heart, he doesn't look on the outward appearance. And that's what I believe, and that's what I'm sticking with. Let's pray. Father, I ask that you would help us to hear your heart, your will, that we might follow you in your ways. Lord, we know that hypocrisy is a besetting sin for all men, but I think sometimes within our culture that the church itself can so easily slip into play acting because we feel such scrutiny by the world around us. That sometimes, Lord, we're so worried about what other people think or how they view or how they see our Christianity that there's a degree of just humility and honesty that gets left behind and we become something other than what you've called us to be. Lord, I don't want to excuse sin, but I am a sinner. And I confess that to you because that's the nature of mankind. And I know that 
no matter how much I give or how much I pray or how much I fast, will not in any way change the reality that I'm a sinner. It's only your grace that makes the difference. Your forgiveness that you show to us when we turn to you in humility and say, Lord, forgive me for I'm a sinner. I know that there are folks here today who need to do that. They may be afraid to do that. Maybe their impression of being a follower of Jesus is all about robes and religion and incense burners and all the rest of that stuff. But help us to understand, Lord, that all it means is that we humbly recognize that you are God and we are not. You're the potter, we're, we're clay. You're the creator, we're the creature. That you created us for your pleasure and that our greatest pleasure is found in pleasing you. And so, Lord, I pray that we would fast from unrighteousness, that we'd fast from those things that steal away the time that you want to spend with us. And we'd use those opportunities to draw near to you that you might fill us. Help us to understand these things and to be free from self-imposed guilt and shame that people can put on us because we're supposed to be doing something according to their self-made rule book. Lord, we ask that you'd help us to seek your face. In Jesus' name, amen.